Well, the Cardiac Zags did it again, securing a second WCC road victory in the final seconds, thanks to a clutch three from Julian Strother. But can this team keep skating by with this poor perimeter defense? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, more odds, and more lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts well it's clear the zags are going to give all of us a heart attack i've made this joke before but if i had any hair on the top of my head i would be pulling it out watching this team play in basketball this season it has been a much different season than we're used to uh, in gonzaga history with a lot more close games a lot more wcc opponents stepping up in a significant way i appreciate that sean farnham and dave fleming two of the best in the business made a point to uh, discuss gonzaga's struggles against WCC teams being less about Gonzaga and more about the WCC teams being just better and the conference improving over time, which I think it's certainly a a bit of both as this Gonzaga team has had their share of struggles. We'll talk about those uh, later in the show a little bit, but Julian Strother coming down the the floor, nine seconds to go, pulls up from three, was a good look. He was wide open. It was the right shot uh, and he knocked it down, giving Gonzaga a one point lead, silencing the crowd, putting students who had already started climbing down the stairs to charge the court. They had to go back to their seats and watch as Anton Watson locked down Spencer Johnson on the other end, forced them to get up, not even really an, an, a legitimate shot attempt and the Zags secured a victory, a real Really fun, really stressful, really exhausting game of basketball. But ultimately, the Zags are now 4-0 and in WCC conference play. Haven't gotten there in the easiest way, but you know what? A win is a win is a win. That has been the case for the Zags so far. In this game, the big story outside of the clutch shot late from Julian Strother was the performance of the bigs. We knew that BYU had a very, very strong defense. We weren't sure that they were going to come out and shoot the lights out. They did. Again, some of that falls on Gonzaga's inability to defend the perimeter. But what Gonzaga was able to do effectively is just dominate this team down low. They spaced the floor. They got their their bigs open looks around the paint. Drew Timmy, 19 points, 13 rebounds. Wasn't his most productive night in terms of shooting. He was only 9 of 18 from the field, which is far from awful. He missed a lot of kind of bunnies around the rim in the second half at at often frustrating times. Uh, But at the end of the day, 19 points, seven offensive rebounds. That was a huge part of the game for the Zags was the ability to dominate on the offensive glass and really on the defensive glass and keep BYU from, from getting second chance opportunities and getting a handful of second chance opportunities themselves. I'm an Anton Watson. I, I'm not sure that there's much more that can be said about Anton Watson that I haven't said. For Quite honestly, at this point, if people are still haters of Anton Watson, it's just willful ignorance. It is intentionally burying your head in the sand, sticking your feet uh, in the mud and saying, I refuse to believe that this player is is as productive as people think he is. Because every everything, analytics, eye test, everything points to Anton Watson being a critical, crucial piece of what this team is doing. He was awesome on both ends of the floor in this game. 18 points, 8 of 12 shooting, including 1 of 1 from deep. It was a really nice three-point attempt. That possession, Efton Reed was fantastic as a perimeter defensive player on the end of the floor, forced a guard from BYU to make a bad pass. Hunter Salas stole the pass that came down the floor, found Anton Watson, who was wide open for a transition three. I've seen Anton hesitate to take that shot before because – Presumably he's aware of his three point percentage and knows that uh, it is not necessarily a strength of his, but it was the, it was, he caught it in stride. It was a perfect look. He knocked it down. Beautiful shot from him. Uh, He also had eight rebounds, a steal and a block. Uh, The block and the steal came at the very end of the game when Gonzaga really needed somebody to step up and play good defense. It was a, a, a fantastic 
again, there's not anything else that can even be said about the performance Anton Watson has had all season long, but really had in this game. They don't win this game without Anton Watson. That was clear to me. And then Ben Gregg. Ben Gregg deserves a huge shout out for the performance he had, mostly in the first half. In fact, I think almost, if not all of his minutes, came in the first half here. Uh, 13 minutes total, but he had 10 points and six boards. Four offensive rebounds for Ben Gregg in 13 minutes of action. Four or five from the floor, two steals and a block. A really, really good game from Ben Gregg. He subbed himself out uh, after his first spurt in the game because he was exhausted, because he was flying up and down the floor, crashing the offensive glass, doing everything he needed to do. It was uh, statistically not his best performance of the season quite yet. He had an 18-point game earlier in the year, but 10-6 and six in 13 minutes on a hostile road environment in a game Gonzaga needed to win against a tough BYU team. You could make an argument this is the most impactful game Ben Gregg has had uh, in a Gonzaga uniform. And I shouted out Efton Reed on the defensive end of the floor. I also was really happy to see him. His first shot attempt was a three-pointer that he probably shouldn't have taken. And the next time down, you could see him hesitate. Uh, when he had an open look, he was trying to look to pass the ball. He finally realized, hey, I have an open look from 14 feet. I'm going to take it. And he knocked it down. And I, I was really happy to see him do that. I think that's a sign of growth for him, a sign of maturity for him, and a sign of the coaching staff being willing to trust him to come into the game, keep him in the game after he maybe took a, an errant shot uh, and let him still continue to produce. He'll play three minutes in this game, but still it was, it was nice to see him show kind of signs of that maturity and that growth. And then the really the, the weak points here for, for this game was two big ones. The the guards offensively and, and frankly defensively were, were pretty bad in this game. It was not a good game from Gonzaga's backcourt. Uh, Rasir Bolden was 0 of 7 from the field. Nolan Hickman 1 of 5. Julian Strother, of course, hit the huge shot at the end of the game. So did Nolan Hickman. His only bucket was really critical. Uh, but he was Strother was 4 of 12 from the game. That means that the three starting guards for Gonzaga were a combined 5 for 24. You do not win a lot of basketball games with your starting three backcourt members shooting 5 for 24, especially when they're not getting it done on the defensive end of the floor. Not all of the perimeter defensive issues were uh, tied to those three guys in particular, of course, but BYU shot 13 of 25 from deep. And I know we have this conversation on the podcast a lot. I know many other people have discussed like, all these bad shooting teams shoot great against Gonzaga. And sometimes it's just fluky. There was a couple of shots that BYU made where I was like, man, that was well contested. That was just a really nice shot or he just, he just knocked it down. But at, at some point you've got to figure out why is Gonzaga getting gashed on the three point line. And, and in this game, just simple eye test. They, they were a lot of wide open looks, <laughs> a lot of wide open threes, a lot of transition threes. That is a huge area of concern for Gonzaga at this point is how come they can't get back in defense and find shooters. They're, they're getting back on defense. Two guys are chasing the ball. The, the, the chaser is going down to the block. And then there's a guy wide open. Spencer Johnson's just standing at the three point line in a, in a shooting position, holding his hands out, ready for the basketball. And nobody on Gonzaga is near him. This happened multiple times, not just with Spencer Johnson. Gideon George had a nice game. A lot of guys from, from BYU had career nights from beyond the arc, and it wasn't just luck. It wasn't just the home crowd willing those shots to go in. It was the fact that Gonzaga had a terrible time finding shooters on the perimeter. If that continues, this team is going to have significant issues in March. Uh, last thing I wanted to shout out, we talked about the guard play. I do want to give a shout out to Hunter Salas. We talked about him a lot on Thursday's show of Locked on Zags about how he played a combined 17 minutes in Gonzaga's two Bay Area games against Santa Clara and San Francisco, despite the fact that Gonzaga was struggling to defend perimeter players uh, for those teams. Brandon Podzimski at Santa Clara, uh, Khalil Shabazz and Tyrell Roberts at San Francisco. Uh, and then uh, maybe Mark Few listened, who knows? <laughs> uh, but the Hunter Salas played much more in this game. He played 19 minutes. Again, that's more than he played in the other two games combined. Five points, two assists, two steals. He took a charge. Uh, he had a clutch three in the final minute. I love, love so much that he took that shot. It was the right read. It was a pass from Drew Timmy off of an errant inbounds pass from BYU. He was wide open and he just buried it. It went from a four point lead for BYU to a one point lead, completely changed the momentum of the game. Uh, of course, Salas also had a massive impact on the defensive end of the floor. It was really, really nice to see him play well. Hopefully he'll be up in that 19 to 20 ish minute range uh, every game going forward. Well, Gonzaga did win the game, but a lot of the issues we saw in this game could impact this team in March. Before we get into that, though, today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by Bet Online. College basketball and the NBA are fully back in action while the NFL playoffs inch closer and closer. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information from all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. 
And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport. So even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags. I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen, make sure to check out the brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball. It is hosted by myself, my co-host, Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels. It's everything you need to know about college basketball in one succinct place. You can hear from big name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. All right, I want to review the five things, uh, the five keys to victory that we laid out before the game. This was on Wednesday's episode of Locked on Zags. We discussed like what Gonzaga needs to do in order to secure victory against BYU. We're going to discuss those things and how they helped uh, lead to a victory in this specific game and also kind of what they may mean for Gonzaga going forward this season. Uh, the number one key in this one was crashing the glass. BYU is a good rebounding team. I thought if they, I thought there was a good chance that they were going to work really hard to out-rebound Gonzaga, and if they did that, I thought that might be a really big problem for the Zags. Well, it wasn't really a big issue. In fact, it is arguably the biggest reason that Gonzaga managed to stay in this game despite BYU shooting the absolute lights out from beyond the arc. The Zags out-rebounded BYU 47-32. to It wasn't particularly close on the rebounding game. And I think the biggest thing, hands down the biggest thing I alluded to, is talking about both Drew Timmy and Ben Gregg. Gonzaga had 17 offensive boards. BYU had seven. Drew Timmy had seven offensive rebounds. Ben Gregg had four. Drew Timmy had the same number of offensive rebounds as all of BYU in this entire game. That was a huge advantage for Gonzaga. Second chance opportunities, uh, cleaning up misses around the rim and quickly getting rebounds to put them back in. Uh, Again, they they also out-rebounded BYU on the defensive end, 30 to 25 in that situation. Really, really nice performance for the Zags. Uh, I think we've seen in some of their best wins this season, Gonzaga has done a really good job of crashing the glass. They did a good job against it again a good job of it, excuse me, against Alabama, a very good job of it against Xavier. Now we see them do a good job against BYU here. And hey, uh, it helps lead to a victory. Next key in this game was forcing turnovers and getting out in transition. Uh, well, B- each team had 16 turnovers, man. That place was loud. It was raucous. And you could see it impact teams. You could see uh, there's multiple times where both teams made a pass to a player who had just cut. I think that there's some communication stuff happening there that's probably doesn't happen at a quieter arena. Uh, we just saw a handful of kind of careless mistakes from both teams. Uh, Gonzaga has to be better. 16 turnovers. We've seen turnover issues play Gonzaga all season long. They were really significant early in the year. I mean, really significant in the early part of the season. Gonzaga kind of cleaned it up a little bit as the year went on, started playing not as good competition. You know, they were worse about the turnovers against teams like Purdue and Texas and, and some of those really good teams they played earlier in the year. Uh, but it's still an issue for Gonzaga. 16 turnovers against BYU. Yeah, hostile road environment. Yeah, BYU has a top 30 defense in the country per Ken Palm, but you've got to take better care of the basketball. On the flip side, forcing BYU into 16 turnovers is fantastic. For a Gonzaga defense that has struggled all season long and quite honestly struggled a lot in this game. They had some good intensity, some good tenacity, especially early in the game, but they could not find shooters around the perimeter. Fortunately, BYU, not a great offensive team, made some mistakes. A lot of the turnovers were self-imposed by BYU, including that the last turnover in the final minute that reminded me eerily of the Roosevelt Jones shot by Butler back in 2013, uh, perhaps dating myself a little bit, but I was in college watching that game. Uh, and uh, you know, an inbounds pass, David Stockton just threw it directly to Roosevelt Jones at Butler. He went down the court, hit a game-winning shot. This was reminiscent of that. A horrific inbounds pass for BYU led to a Hunter Salas three. Uh, so for Gonzaga, forcing those turnovers really, really helped. An interesting part of this game, too, though, is the transition offense aspect. BYU was very good at getting out in transition, and the way that they attacked in transition wasn't by getting to the rim and getting to the free throw line, which is kind of what I expected them to do. It was transition threes, and man, they the fact that they missed 12 threes in this game honestly shocks me. I don't remember them missing any of them. It seemed like every single time BYU took a three-pointer, that thing was going down. They were absolutely relentless. And, and kudos to Mark Pope and the offense. They did a good job. They, they ran some well-designed plays to get guys open looks. But Gonzaga's defense was horrific in transition. And the ability for BYU to get 
out in transition, make throw ahead passes to players, get open looks. And Gonzaga's inability to do that, Gonzaga tried to get out in transition a lot in this game. The amount of times that they got across half court with somebody full steam ahead, whether it was Salas, whether it was Malachi Smith, Rasir Bolton, Nolan Hickman, whomever. And then they had to kind of quickly pump the brakes because there was two or three BYU defenders in front of them and maybe only one or two teammates in front of them. And Gonzaga's forced to pull it out and end up setting up their half-court offense. Now, their half-court offense was pretty effective, especially for their uh, low post players in this game. So it wasn't a huge issue. But Gonzaga's going to need to find this transition offense at some point. The reason they came back against Memphis last year in the NCAA tournament was solely based on their ability to get out in transition. If they run into a game like that in the NCAA tournament and they cannot get their guys out in transition, it could potentially be an issue for the Bulldogs. So hopefully they'll find a way to get more transition offense, more easy buckets that way because because in a game like this where they forced 16 turnovers and they couldn't really capitalize in transition, at least not as much as they probably should have, uh, that's that's an area of concern going forward for the Zags. The next key here was to avoid cheap fouls. BYU gets to the free throw line a lot. I thought there was an opportunity for, for a couple of Gonzaga's bigs to maybe get in foul trouble early. We've seen Hunter Salas get in foul trouble uh, in, a, in short spurts of time before. Uh, and that was just it was just a non-factor in this game in part because the refs really let both teams play uh, BYU fans were not happy with the referees for large chunks of the game, especially in the first half. Uh, there were some calls that went against BYU without a doubt. Uh, there was a block shot that should have been a goaltending then, Hey, you know what? That kind of stuff happens. It is what it is, but by and large, the referees let both teams play. BYU only took 10 free throws in this game. Gonzaga only took 13 free throws were just not a big factor in this game. Neither team shot. Well, BYU was five of 10 from the free throw line. That is really bad. They can knock down 13 threes and, and you look at how did a team that knocked down 13 threes lose? Well, they let Gonzaga do whatever they want down in the paint. And also they only took five or they only made five free throws. That's really going to hurt. Now, of course, Gonzaga seven of 13. So, you know, if you want to nitpick Anton Watson's game, one of four from the free throw line, that's a problem that needs to change. It hasn't changed all season long. Drew Timmy, I think he was one of three. I could be mistaken. Regardless, he did not shoot well from the free throw line either. Uh, so it wasn't really a big factor in this game. The only player who was in foul trouble really all game long was Gideon George for BYU. And that ended up being a bit of an issue for them. They had to take him out for a while late in the game when he picked up his fourth foul. They brought him back in the game and he played very well. He had a really clutch three for BYU towards the end of the game, uh, even with four fouls. But it did impact his ability to be aggressive on the defensive end of the floor. The next key, and this is a key for the Zags going forward this season, really, uh, and I think that perhaps the biggest thing that has come out of this three-game stretch for Gonzaga is keeping your composure and tuning out the noise. Gonzaga doesn't play a lot of hostile road games, and this is not necessarily a criticism of Mark Few's coaching or Mark Few's scheduling because I think that the this team attempts to play a lot of home-and-homes, but teams rarely agree to play home-and-homes because they don't want to play in the kennel. That is... Uh, not something that we're making up. That's a, that's a fact. It's a documented fact. John Calipari said it. Uh, other coaches who have not, who maybe don't have the uh, bravado, I guess, to say that publicly, uh, believe it. They absolutely believe it. And so you see a lot of teams that play neutral home and homes or, you know, a neutral site thing like the Alabama game in Seattle and Birmingham, which I have not, I don't criticize that series because I thought it was very fun, but like, let's play that game at home. Like, let, why not play that game at home, play Alabama on a true road game? Like that stuff's more fun uh, because these true road environments are help teams kind of prove that they have the metal, help teams show that they can respond to adversity. They can fight through crowds just cheering and jeering and screaming in their faces and all of that good stuff. Literally in the case of the San Francisco game, screaming right in their faces, that shouldn't happen all that often. We know that, but uh, the, BYU is one of the toughest places to play in the country. Hands down. Uh, there is no debate in my mind that the Marriott center is absolutely one of the toughest places to play in the entire country. Huge student section, really dedicated fan base, whole bunch of signs. It's loud. That place is absolutely popping. The, the fact that Baylor and Kansas and teams like that are now going to be playing there every year in the Big 12, holy cow, that's going to be really fun. I'm not sure that BYU has got much of a chance of being a, a significant player in the, uh, in the Big 12, at least not until their recruiting ticks up a little bit. But, man, they're not going to make it easy for any single team that comes into that arena and tries to play there because that place is really, really good. And the Zags did it. The Zags made careless mistakes. When BYU would get hot, you'd see dumb turnovers. You'd see Anton Watson just threw a pass straight out of bounds at one point. Uh, he's not the only one. A handful of other players made similar mistakes like that. Uh, and that kind of stuff happens in true road environments because it's hard. It's hard to play in that. And you can't hear. 
I mean, I think some, some of the straight up issue, the, how many times we see players continue to play after a whistle blew? There was one time when Drew Timmy jumped on Gideon George trying to block a shot and George had stopped going up because the whistle blew. Drew clearly didn't hear it. He kind of grabbed Gideon and apologized. It wasn't a big deal. But like those that, that stuff doesn't happen in a lot of Gonzaga's road environments. It doesn't happen because they're not experiencing that level of constant noise, constant enthusiasm from the crowd. I think this is hugely important for Gonzaga to experience this. And you can tell that it was something that they got down, they got frustrated, and they've clawed their way back. They were down 10 with five minutes to go. They were down four with a minute and a half to go. And BYU had the basketball. Now, BYU choked significantly down the stretch, made some very bad decisions with the basketball, and that was part of the reason Gonzaga was able to come back and win. But at the end of the day, Gonzaga's ability to keep their composure through a really, really hostile road environment and win a game like that, there's nothing but good things for what this team mean, what this means for this team in March. And then the final key, a big game from Julian Strother. Well, it wasn't a big game, but you know what it was? In the words of Sean Farnham, who responded to a tweet of mine uh, shortly after the game, uh, Sean had said that he thought Julian Strother was due for a big game. I basically tweeted, hey, I agree with Sean. I think Julian Strother needs to have a big game for the Zags. And, And Sean responded after the game and said, maybe it wasn't a big game, but it was a big shot. Yes, sir, it was. Four of 12 shooting for the game for Julian, two of seven from deep, but he knocked it down when he needed to. Again, uh, credit to Mark Few and the staff for allowing their players to feel confident to take that shot. Julian made the absolute right read. He talked about it after the game. He said, I was dribbling down the court and I saw that, you know, Drew kind of stepped in to set a little screen and I saw the defender going underneath it and I realized I have an open look. I'm going to take it. And he's like, I practiced that shot a bunch and I knew I was it was the right shot. And it was. He absolutely read the, read the play right. Uh, I, I know I'm sure plenty of people kind of held their breath when they saw Julian take a pull up three with 10 seconds still on the clock, but it was the right read, nothing but net, and it led the Zags to a victory. All right, we're going to close out the show looking ahead to Gonzaga's first home game of the year 2023 against the upstart Portland Pilots, who have struggled since the Phil Knight Invitational, but just beat the University of San Francisco Dons at home. Coming up right after this. All right, segment three, still any patents, still locked on Zags, and we're still talking WCC hoops here as we preview Gonzaga's Saturday evening game against the Portland Pilots at the McCarthy Athletic Center, the first home game of the year 2023 for the Bulldogs. The game is slated to start at 7 p.m. on Saturday. It'll be on ESPN2. I am sure there will be some level of basketball or hockey or something on the screen that will delay the start of that game, but it should be a very, very fun one. So let's meet the Portland Pilots, we've talked about them a handful of times on this podcast already for those of you who listen on a regular basis. Uh, Portland is is in the second year of the Shantae Leggins era, a much, much improved era for the Pilots than the Terry Porter era, which was an absolute unmitigated disaster for the Pilots. Uh, they really, really struggled under Coach Porter, but uh, Shantae came in. He brought a lot of transfers with him, uh, many of them from Eastern Washington, where he previously worked. Uh, brought a handful of other guys from other schools and had a really, really good year last year, massively improved from where they were a year previously. Uh, this season started out really good uh, with the performance in the Phil Knight Invitational, uh, but things have not gone quite as well since then. Uh, overall, the Pilots 9-10 and 10 on the year, 1-3 and three in conference play. They were on a five-game losing streak before they beat San Francisco. That game at San Francisco, excuse me, against San Francisco at the Child Center, 92 to 87 was the final score. The Pilots secured a victory there. Uh, they are, again, that was their first win in conference play. Uh, they played LMU, BYU, and St. Mary's, three good teams, but the results were not pretty. They got beat by 20 points by the LMU Lions, a team that is should be comparable to them in the WCC standings, and they got boat raced badly by the Lions. BYU beat them by, I think, 13 or so. And then St. Mary's, boy, howdy, did St. Mary's absolutely hand it to the Portland Pilots. They won by 42 points. St. Mary's doesn't score 42 points in a game sometimes. And that's not even a criticism of them. That's just a fact. And St. Mary's absolutely waxed the Pilots by 42 points. This Portland team has really struggled. Injuries have been a big part of that. Moses Wood has been out for a few games. He returned in time for the San Francisco game. And hey, guess what? He dropped 20 points and they beat the Dons. So having Moses Wood back is a huge benefit for them. Uh, Again, I I touched on the Phil Knight Invitational. We'll talk about what happened there again. They Lost to North Carolina, who, of course, at the time was the number one team in the country. North Carolina has since fallen significantly all the way out of the standings before climbing back in. Uh, but they they were – I think they lost by eight, but Moses Wood stepped out of bounds on a three-point attempt that I think would have tied the game 
in like the closing minutes. It was a really, really close game. Uh, they lost to Michigan State by just one point, and that loss has continued to age well as Michigan State has has looked like a good team all season long under Tom Izzo. They got a win over Villanova, unfortunately not a win that has aged exceptionally well because Villanova has significantly struggled under Coach Kyle Neptune, but still a nice win for Portland. Um, nice performances against North Carolina and Michigan State. Four and six since then because of the injuries. Ken Palm has them all the way down at 161 uh, in the country. Offensively, 104th. Defensively, 238th. They are not a good team on the defensive end of the floor. Gonzaga shouldn't have any problem getting up over 80, 85, maybe even 90 points. Uh, Again, St. Mary scored 85 on them. San Francisco, even in the loss, scored 87 on them. Gonzaga might hit triple digits here, especially at home uh, after a couple of challenging games. They're going to come out and score the crap out of the basketball here. Portland's a good scoring team as well. They average about 77 points a game. Uh, They shoot 37% from deep. They are a good, efficient outside shooting team led by Tyler Robertson. Tyler Robertson is awesome. He's a really, really fun player to watch. He's a do-it-all guard. He's averaging 14.5 points per game, five boards, five and a half assists, uh, a threat for a triple-double pretty much every single night. Uh, He's not an efficient scorer, though. He's under 40% from the field, just over 30% from deep. Uh, Really, really good at getting to the free-throw line. I believe he set an NCAA record earlier in the season by scoring. I think he had 24 free-throws. I think he had 24 of 24 from the free-throw line, something ridiculous like that. Uh, He had over 30 points on like less than five field goal attempts in the game. So a guy that's going to try to get to the free throw line, try to get Gonzaga's bigs to foul him around the rim. Uh, and if if he succeeds at that, it could make a long night for the Bulldogs. I mentioned Moses Wood already. Him coming back was an immediate boost for the for the Pilots. Again, they lost by badly in their three non three conference games prior to Moses Wood returning. He comes back, he drops twenty points, uh, and then all of a sudden they beat the Dons. He's averaging fourteen points, six boards, shooting thirty seven percent from deep. Uh, but again, this team really struggles on the defensive end of the floor. They are outside the top three hundred in steals and blocks per game. They don't steal the basketball. They don't force a lot of turnovers. They don't get a lot of block shots. I think they average like two and a half blocks per game. There are like multiple players in the NCAA who average more blocks per game, multiple. So it's just not something they do a lot of. Uh, and it's something that's going to, that's obviously going to be a factor against the Zags. They have a little bit of size. They have two guys, Vucinich and St. Pierre, who are over 6'10 or who are 6'10. They're both rotation players. They're not significant parts of what uh, Portland does, but they are at least big guys who are going to go out there and, and put their bodies in front of Drew Timmy and try to stop him from getting baskets. Uh, last year, Portland really, really, really packed the paint against Gonzaga at, on the, at home when Gonzaga was at home, packed the paint, really tried to eliminate Drew Timmy from even getting the basketball. Uh, Gonzaga responded by shooting and making 18 threes in that game. I think it was a, a program record. Uh, so we'll see if Shantae and the Pilots try that strategy again. Teams have found the most success this season by slowing Gonzaga down and uh, limiting touches for Drew Timmy, or at least swarming him as soon as he gets the basketball. Uh, again, Gonzaga's only has three losses this year. They're a very, very good team. So calling it successful is a bit challenging, but when Drew Timmy struggles like he did against San Francisco, uh, you put yourself in a position to win. So I suspect that they're going to do everything they can to try to stop Drew Timmy, but this is a bigger team. Gonzaga is a bigger team. They're a stronger team. They're a faster team. uh, And Portland just doesn't have the defensive horses, I think, to to really stop Gonzaga from getting up over 85, 90 points per game. And while I think Portland's a decent offensive team, and while I think that they're going to study heavily the tape to figure out how how to score against Gonzaga's defense, which hasn't proven to be that difficult. Uh, I just don't think that they're going to score enough points uh, to outdo what how many points Gonzaga's going to score. I, I expect to score something along the lines of like 95 to 78 or something in that kind of ballpark where both teams are going to score a lot of points, but Gonzaga's just going to score a lot more because Portland doesn't have a lot of uh, defensive talent, quite honestly, on the roster. And I think Gonzaga's going to come out and, and uh, play in front of the home crowd and go, go get themselves a victory on Saturday night. All right, that is going to do it for today and for this week. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, please go check out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. You can find it uh, on YouTube. You can go to Locked On Zags channel. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Scroll down. You'll find the Locked On College Basketball feed. You can go hit that subscribe button as well. I want to thank you all for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. And, of course, for now, heading into the weekend, go Zags.